So what we're going to be talking about this week is about how to do research with people. And fundamentally, this is a lot of what the social sciences are about, right? We focus on doing research with people because people are what we're interested in. There are lots of different ways you can do research with people. Um, what we're going to be focusing on today is working on collecting data from people as individuals, right? So rather than working with entire communities, which we're going to talk about uh, in the next unit, we're going to talk about how you work one-on-one -on -one or in a small constructed group with people to try to learn something about them. When we talk about doing social research, one of the points that I have said a thousand times already by this point in the semester probably is that you, the person doing the research, are part of the research process. You are in some ways the measurement instrument that goes out and solicits the data, right? You are not a random probe poking somebody. You are not a totally impartial video recorder that's just sat there. You're an active part of the process. And this is most important when you're working directly with people to collect information about them because they respond to you. In addition to this being a research encounter, it's also a human encounter between people. And it really thrives on the human connection. The better you can make a human connection to the people you're interviewing or participating in a focus group with or doing a survey with, the better you'll be able to get data and the more sure you'll be able to be of your results. But this actually takes a lot of work. Interviewing somebody isn't just like sitting down and having a chat with them. Running a focus group isn't like running a seminar in a classroom or even just sitting around and hanging out with your friends and talking, even though it builds on a lot of those skills. Doing any of this requires building up ways to connect to people that allow you to learn what you need to learn, all the while maintaining ethical boundaries that are important for interaction with human subjects and people, right? as well as being able to be confident that you're learning what you mean to learn. So the first principle to always keep in mind when you're thinking about these like human connections that are at the heart of working with people is the simple question of a burden. Is what you're asking people to do worth it? Now you might say, oh, but I'm doing research. Of course it's worth it. Not really. Not all research projects are worth bothering people to get you to answer your questions, right? Not everybody has infinite time. In fact, nobody has infinite time. And the time that they spend talking to you and sharing their ideas with you is a burden on them. And so the question is, is it an excessive burden? Are you asking them for things that are not fair of you to ask? And is the benefit of the research, both to knowledge in general and to you, worth it? If somebody's given a bunch of interviews to the press, do you really need to interview them? Again, can't you just read what they've already written? If an organization has lots of material on its website, do you need to interview them to find out material that you're just going to be re-asking them questions about? Think about always, before you engage in any kind of project where you interact with people, can I get this information another way? Do I need to directly go in and spend this person's time and energy to get them to answer my question? This is a lot of reasons why when people run surveys, right? Other people reuse that data to analyze different questions. Why? Because somebody's already asked the question, and it's better not to bother people again. Another major thing to think about in your exchange with people is are you being fair and honest in what you're sharing with them? Are you giving them a realistic idea of how much time it will take to come to your focus group to fill out your survey? Um, are you giving them a realistic idea of what your research is about, right? While there may be certain times when it is considered permissible to um, go on and engage in deception during research, it really has an effect on your ability to connect with the people you're talking to. Um, what's the way in which you're showing them how they'll be represented? And of course, you need to work out the relationship between being honest to what you learn and what you think and what you develop as a result of the interview contact and being respectful of what a person says, how they think about themselves, and those questions, right? So all of this together pre presents a scenario 
where you need to be as open and upfront about what you're doing and what your purpose is and what the outcomes are going to be. And in fact, one of the most important elements of this is making sure that people have the ability to decline participation. If they decide that talking to you is going to be too burdensome, if they decide that talking to you is going to be repetitive and not worth their time, they need to have the ability to make that decision at the beginning of the process so that you don't get all tied up and then they become resentful later on. A lot of what I've just talked about is linked to some of the core principles of research ethics as embodied in the protocols that we use here in Canada, right? The fact that people need to have full and informed consent, that they need to be able to decline and withdraw participation at any time, that they need to be able to be fully apprised of what the research situation they're entering into is, right? So remember when we looked at the research ethics form, which many of you are going to be filling out as a part of your process for uh, for doing your final project for this class. However, I want you to think beyond merely the Research Ethics Board's principles, right? The principles embodied in TCPS. What I want you to think about is the ethic of relational accountability that we've spoken about repeatedly in this class. How can you have an open, transparent, and accountable relationship with the people you're interacting with in the course of conducting research? How can you let them know that you respect them? How can you demonstrate that you want to be open to them? How can you demonstrate that you are engaging in a mutual and not an extractive relationship? That's what's most important. Even though our formal principles of research ethics don't include rules around relational accountability, I want all of you as researchers to think long and hard whenever you engage in these human connections with people through your research about what you owe them and how you can pay that debt. Most of us talk to people every day. We do it in our smallest encounters. We do it for long periods of time. We have lots of different exchanges with people. And so what you know about how to talk to people from your daily life is an important part of conducting research with people. But it's not the entire picture. The thing about research, what makes it different from everyday life, is the set of intentional choices you make to plan and learn about particular areas, right? I'm certain I've said this before. So what matters about talking to people for research is the set of choices you make and that you make them deliberately and intentionally at all points along the spectrum, right? This is not a situation where there's one clear right answer. What there usually is is a range of correct answers. And you have to pick which ones serve your project the best. The first decision you have to make when you're going to be talking to people is to think about who you're going to talk to. This has to do with delimiting the universe of people who you could conceivably speak to. You don't want a category that's like, I want to interview women. Well, OK, women is a pretty big category. It includes people all over the place. It includes people with different histories, with different races. Um, which includes both cis and trans women. It includes people with different sexualities, different class backgrounds, different educations, different political outlooks. So you can see, trying to say, I'm going to talk to women, well, that's an almost impossible task to try to get some kind of scope going there. So what you need to do is come up with a category that you think helps you serve your purpose. If what you want to learn about is how women conceptualize their political participation in Canadian elections, well then, you need women who have voted in Canadian elections, right? You need women who uh, have some kind of political consciousness. You need women who speak your language, right? You can't interview them if you can't talk to them. Um, and so then you would need to kind of delimit that, right? Oftentimes, people will have a very specific subset of people they want to speak to. I want to speak to people who've received Ontario Works benefits in the past 12 months who live in the Ottawa, Gatton, in the Ottawa region. OK, that's a pretty specific ask, but it allows you to say something meaningful about that population, right? And then what you can do is say, OK, is what I can say about this population, does it generalize to other populations, or am I just telling this story? Right? You can also say something like, I want to speak to people who participated in this protest. right? Because you want to learn about the people who participated in it and about the protest. Again, that's a sort of boundary that you can put around something that will help you limit the people you're talking to and be specific and rational about choosing them. Right? 
<clears throat> you also need to set the number of people you want to talk to, which is usually a function of two things. It's a function of how much time you have and what kind of data you're collecting, right? How much time you have. If you're doing a paper for your seminar, then you probably don't have time to talk more than one or two people in the course of the end of the semester, maybe three or four at the most. If you're writing a master's thesis, generally I see students who are using qualitative methods in their master's theses interview somewhere around 12 people, often closer to 10, sometimes closer to 15, often not even that, depending on their ability to contact people. Right? Um, if you, the other thing that matters is how you think about um, what kind of analysis you want to do. If you're going to be using a quantitative analysis of a data set based on the, the material you gather from these people, then you need to have enough people to get some kind of statistical uh, weight behind your analysis. And we can talk about that a little more when we do the sessions on numbers at the end of the semester. But you need to make sure you have enough people that you can generalize and make some good uh, deductions about the sample and about the population at large. So who to talk to is your first step. The second question is what to ask. Now, there are lots of ways to go about this. Obviously, most of the time, what you do is compile a set of questions. Um, those questions can be opened or closed in the sense that people can answer whatever they want or people have to pick off very particular boxes. Um, those questions can include all sorts of different material. What you need to make sure is that the list of questions you have is not burdensome, right? that it's something people are qualified to answer, and also that you're prepared to be able to logically justify how to connect what you're asking to the answers you want to give. right? You want that connection. You don't want to spend a lot of time asking people questions that don't relate to the answers that you need to answer your research question. You also don't want to spend so much time asking people really detailed questions that they get exhausted in the process. right? I once worked with a student for her master's thesis who had asked a lot of essentially yes or no questions in her interviews. And her interview sheet originally was like massive. And I said, is this really what you want to do? Are these really the answers you want to get? And she said, no, I just thought I had to ask these questions. So I said, nope, nope, you don't need to ask any of these questions. You just need to ask these people to tell their stories. And so we worked on a better list of questions that enabled people to tell their stories. Right? The next thing is to know how to ask. And in one way, this is about, OK, it's about like how do you structure the interview? Do you start with some questions that are more general? Do you let people warm up? Um, some people I know who research uh, political officials and other high-powered people always begin with their most key question because they never know when the research subject is going to say, I'm sorry, I have a meeting and need to leave. All right, so think about how you want to structure the conversation. But this is also where you make the choice about what kind of method of collecting data from people you want to receive. In general, we'll talk about three that are most important for political science. That would be the survey, which is a closed, usually a document, though sometimes it's administered orally, where you get information from people where they answer very specific questions. And then you normally analyze it using statistics. The second is the interview, where you speak to people one-on-one -on -one and ask them direct questions. And the third method is the focus group, where you speak to people together. We'll talk about each of them separately in our, um, our specific modules for this week. But right now, just think generally. What sort of information do you want to get? And is it best captured using a flat document like a survey, using the interaction of an interview, or using the group collection of a focus group, right? So think about those methods. And the last set of choices you have to make is about how to behave. Now, there's some basic principles here. You want to behave in a way that will not offend, put off, or otherwise create a bad experience, right? Think about relational accountability. So be on time, be respectful, address people they want to, the way they want to be addressed, um, act professional, right? But all of these things are different in different contexts. So for instance, when I'm going, knowing I'm going to interview people, I dress differently based on who I'm going to interview. If I'm going to interview activists, I wear slightly more relaxed clothing, right? If I were to show up to interview uh, people who were street activists 
in a far left movement, if I show up wearing a suit, nobody's going to talk to me. Then again, if I'm going in to talk to the president of public relations for a bank, if I don't wear a suit, I'm not going to be taken seriously. Right? And so I've had both those interviews, and I vary what I wear between the cases, the times. Right? I'm also very conscious about if what I'm wearing will elicit a negative or a positive reaction in the person I'm talking to. Right? You sometimes you might prefer to be a little bit shocking in your everyday life, but that's not always the best way to approach a research interview. What you want to make sure is that whatever you're wearing won't cause a reaction that will overwhelm your ability to make a connection to the person you're talking to. This doesn't mean you need to hide things about yourself. It doesn't mean you need to retreat into a kind of shell of I am a formal and professional person. You're not a tape recorder. You're a human being. But it's worth thinking about how you present yourself such that you can make a good connection to the, pers the person that you're working with. So, the other thing is, how do you behave in that exchange such that people feel comfortable with you, such that they don't feel put off by the formalness of the encounter, such that they have an experience that leaves them not feeling upset about the process at the end? You've got to make sure that whatever exchange you have with people in the process of interacting with them for research, you do so in a way that, so far as possible, leaves everyone with a positive experience. There's a fundamental problem for positivists and for other people who have a very strict truth epistemology in their approach to research with people, which is that people aren't always correct. All of us can be incorrect at any point in time, and many times it's not a question of who's correct or incorrect, but it's a question of how do we analyze and think about the situation, right? So everyone has their own perspective. Everyone has their own view on how things are working. And whatever perspective or analysis they have, it's going to creep into how they respond to things, right? So sometimes people say, I want to collect information from people, but I want to make sure they're telling the truth. How can I make sure they're not lying to me? And the answer is, well, you can do some things to try to make sure they're not lying to you, but fundamentally, you just have to trust the people you're talking to, right? Which means, on the one hand, believing them when they say something, because they're saying it based on their own understanding and analysis of the situation. And on the other hand, admitting the possibility that the information somebody can give you might not be correct, right? They might be simply mistaken. They might not feel comfortable telling you the, an, an answer. They might be more comfortable telling someone else. They might avoid a question. Right? All of this is part of the process. And what having a really open mind in the research process means is trusting people to tell you what they can tell you and that they're not deliberately out to harm you. Right? And you don't need to kind of poke or argue against them. What research with people allows you to do is allows you to get them to tell their story. Now, their understanding of their story may not be what you would think from their story, right? It may not be what you would tell in that same scenario, or even what the next person who's lived through the same scenario would tell. That's fine. That's part of the process, right, of understanding that different people will approach these issues differently. Right? Different people will have their own attitudes. So one thing that's very important is to differentiate when you're talking to people about what you're asking them to tell you. Are you asking them to tell you what they think? Well, they're the only person who can tell you what they think, and their report of what they think can't be incorrect. Now, it's possible they could dissemble. They could avoid answering the question. They could even misrepresent what they think because of anxiety about telling you what they actually think. But fundamentally, all you can do is ask them and report their answers. We don't have any magic telepathy that we can get into people's minds and figure them out. Now, social, sci social psychologists in particular have noticed a couple things that you can recognize might be distorting people's um, people's answers when you ask them what they think. So for instance, they might be trying to conform to a social desirability bias. 
So for instance, people are often reluctant to admit things that they know aren't socially acceptable, right? If you ask people if they've done something that they feel they could be judged for asking, they're less likely to say yes. And there are ways around this. So for instance, if a person is right in your face and is asking you, have you ever done something that is socially undesirable, you're less likely to say yes because you have to make eye contact with that person and admit to it. However, people are a little more, off, more likely to answer it on phone surveys or on paper surveys than if they have to make eye contact with somebody while saying it. The other thing you can do is you can find ways for people to admit to um, things that they think of as very negative or that they don't think they'll be willing to admit to by allowing them to do it um, through a kind of alternate means. So for instance, um, there's such a thing as a list experiment. In the list experiment, you divide the people you're surveying up into two groups. The first group, you give them a list of behaviors, and you say, how many of these have you ever witnessed occurring, or a list of uh, activities? How many of these have you done? Don't tell me which ones, just tell me how many, and the person will count and say, okay, I've done seven of these 10 activities, right? Then you give the other half of the group um, an activity that has 11 activities, where the one you really want to know the prevalence of is that one that's different. And people look at that and say, okay, I've done eight of these activities, right? And if you find consistently that there's a difference between the number of people, number of activities people say they did in the list experiment that has the thing you're trying to list, look for and the list experiment where that doesn't, then you would say, okay, that's the prevalence of this behavior. Right? Because on average, it's the distance, difference between the two scores. Right? Um, so that's a way of kind of trying to get people to reveal something while allowing them not to feel uncomfortable at the process of revealing it. Right? So sometimes you're trying to get people to talk about what they do. And again, here you have to worry about social desirability bias. You also have to remember that people have faulty memories. Right? Nobody has a perfect memory. There's a classic example of an experiment where a bunch of college students were asked to watch a video of some people playing basketball. And one group was asked to count how many times the red team scored, and one group was able to ask to count how many times the blue team scored. Well, in the middle of this, a person in a gorilla suit walked across the screen. Right? Like, right up there, in front, not quickly, it's not a flashing thing. The number of people who remembered the gorilla was almost zero because they were entirely focused on the task they were supposed to be doing. So asking people what happened or what did you do, if their attention was focused elsewhere, they might not have remembered it, right? Or they might remember a more socially desirable version. I always vote. I voted in every election is an idea that people have about themselves. And so therefore, if you ask them, did you vote in this particular election? If they have a notion of themselves that says, yes, I always vote, then they'll say yes. But they may not have voted. They may have forgotten. Or if you ask them, who did you vote for in this election? Well, they might remember who they voted for. Or they might say, uh, I probably voted for the person from this party. Or I probably voted for that candidate because I remember their name. Right? So people's memories are faulty. So you want to try to work out a scenario where people have the best chance of not making an honest mistake. So you want to ask them questions close to when things occurred. Right? Um, the other thing is sometimes what you want people to do is talk about what they know or how they analyze the world. Right? What they remember of an event and why they think people made these choices. Right? Um, who decided who was going to speak at the rally? Who decided the order in which people were going to present their motions uh, on the bill? Things like that, right? What was the process by which that was done? And these are, again, things that only people can tell you, right? Because they can report on the processes they participated in, the conversations they were a part of. And that's really important. But once you start asking people for that kind of narrative, you're asking them for an analysis. Right? And everyone's analysis of a situation is going to be different. If you ask people, what are your organization's three top priorities for the next year? Well, 
every person in the organization is going to have a different response to that, right? Maybe if it's a highly democratic organization and they've already had a conversation about it, they could say, well, collectively, we've decided that A, B, and C are our priorities, but that's very rare, right? What's much more likely is that they'll say, well, personally, my priorities are that we do this, this, and this, right? And then you go and ask the person at the cubicle next to them, and they'll have a different set of priorities. Now, some of this is why we talk to multiple people. Some of this is also why we make sure that we take that what people are saying are what they are saying. It is their perspective. It is their analysis of the world, right? Sometimes people will say, I want this to happen because if it doesn't happen, this will be the consequence. And you may say, that's an unlikely consequence. That's not going to happen, right? Or you may say, that's not the right consequence. You should be worried about the consequence of doing the action instead. But that's your analysis of the scenario, right? So while you, in your analysis of the data, may say, I disagree with these people, right? They have that analysis, and it is not your job to correct them. It is not your job to obscure their ideas. What your job is, is to understand what they're saying and be able to express it and talk about its consequences, right? The most important thing you can do as a researcher who is working with people is to trust the people you're talking to. Trust them and listen to the story they're telling. Use that story to draw your conclusions. That will give you the strongest possible analysis for the work you want to do.